I haven't been podcasting for a while, haven't been streaming for a while, so I've missed out on a bunch of things. But the one thing that I didn't miss out on, the one thing that I haven't missed out on and I've been really enjoying watching, I'm not going to lie, has been the absolute demolition and teardown and destruction of the one and only Tony the Wolf Hinchcliffe in real time. I've been loving watching everybody wake up to the same realization that most of us comedy podcasters, comedy podcast fans have always had. Tony Hinchcliffe's a bit of a wanker, isn't it? He's a bit of a wanker. This is why. There's a lot going on. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. Ooh, right. the, the crowd okay. noise. The We're crowd gonna, reaction. Yeah, normally I don't follow the national anthem, everybody. Yeah, let's uh, blame the national anthem. The crowd reaction. Like he literally slapped a baby on stage. Honestly, you have to replay it just for the crowd reaction alone. They were not pleased. Like, oh, why would you say that? We're Puerto Rican. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> a lot going on. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> We're getting there. Now, again, normally I don't follow the national anthem, everybody. Oh, uh, uh, lo you got to love comedians. And it's always the room. It's always the space. It's always who, they, who's, who they're following, the temperature, the platform, blah, blah. Anyway, long story less long. If you don't know what's going on, um, obviously the election in America is about to conclude, right? The election is happening, happening in November or something. So Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are going head to head, toe for toe, rally for rally, or as Brenda would say, rally for rally, um, trying to drum up those votes, trying to drum up that support. And they decided, you know, some of them to bring out some celebrity um, speakers to route, you know, to rally the fucking viewers and to get them more motivated and pumped to get out there and vote. So for this particular rally, um, Trump Vance Rally, they decided to hire the one and only Tony Hinchcliffe, the roast master. Now, personally for me, in my humble opinion, it's pretty weird to hire a roast comic for a rally. Unless, you know, it, it doesn't make sense really. No? Or my, my, I don't know. It doesn't really make sense. Like, if you're going to host, if you're going to have a comedian on there, just get him on there to do, like, jokes. Just to run for a set. Go for a routine. Like, if anything, you know what would have been actually a better idea? If they would have hired a comedian and just said, hey, think of this as, like, you performing at the late night show. Like, whatever late show that exists, right? If they're still around. Think of it as you getting a slot on the late show. You've got 10 minutes or maybe eight minutes. Give us some of your best hits. Doesn't matter if they're, it's, if it's 20 year old material, if it's like whatever, just give us your best hits, eight minutes or just pure fire and then bow off gracefully, make America great again, salute the crowd and keep it moving. But they didn't. They let Tony Hinchcliffe go on stage and do what he does, which is roast, do whatever he wants to do. And he completely fell flat on his face. Completely didn't read the room, completely didn't, you know, um, did not um, know what the assignment was, completely failed. And it's been so glorious to watch because in the last few years, for whatever reason, or maybe mostly because of COVID, I feel like the, that group of LA comedians have like started to lean a lot more right. But it's mostly because of COVID, I think. Because COVID lockdown closed, you know, a lot of clubs had to close, um, a lot of hospitality, a lot of kind of, you know, venues in general were the first to close and last to reopen. So a lot of these comedians think it's their God-given right to tell jokes. So without the, you know, and they think, you know, um, being a comedian is, a, is akin to being a nurse or a doctor or something. They think they're an essential worker. So whenever there was a state in this, whenever there was a, whenever there was a, um, uh, a politician in the States who was maybe against, you know, knocking down the restrictions about clubs and bars opening, they would most likely be Republican or conservative and they would mostly lean against that side and kind of champion them. And obviously over time it's become a bit of a troll to be a bit of a Trump fan, unironically, so there's mostly leaning on that side. But most of it is just them kind of fanboying out over Trump because, you know, 
he's basically a celebrity and it's probably somebody a lot of these guys kind of look up to so it's been quite funny to watch tony hinchcliffe who prob who's been not probably if you watch a lot of kill tony and him on pods anyway he's been sucking di donald trump's dick for a long time he's been really angling you know for that kind of crowd some would say larping cosplaying grifting for that kind of republican fan base the whole austin texas move wearing the big belt buckles with the cowboy hats and the little down jacket vesting like the way he you know getting into sports weirdly enough it's like huh this guy likes sports like, okay what whatever so he's been trying to like you know angle for that love and for that affection he finally gets seen and recognized by that group of people i think if we're not if we're not if we're to believe what donald trump said on the rogan interview a lot of this is because of baron trump allegedly baron trump is a big fan of comedy so he's the one that's tapping his dad into all this sort of shit and jd vance so allegedly he's the one that hooked up the jd vance and fear Vaughn. he's the one that hooked up the donald trump and rogan allegedly people are you know it's a it's a meme whatever um even if it's not true he finally gets seen by the republican party he finally, finally gets seen by trump he's finally recognized and acknowledged by his hero then he gets on stage and he completely shits the bed i personally like it because this is another example of comedians being unable to just entertain the crowd because i don't think this joke is that crazy offensive but it's just unnecessary you know it's not even that bad it's just unnecessary why would you go on stage and go out of your way to denigrate and humiliate and embarrass and insult a large portion of the republican fact especially i think that was in new york or something right especially in new york you'd imagine you know a lot of republicans a lot of you you'd imagine a lot of new yorkers would be of that kind of you know maybe dominican puerto rican who are probably trump fans as well so to go there and do that to them just is super out of order and not needed and you could have easily gone on stage, I feel like, as a comedian, and just gave your best hits and still did a good job. You could have easily gone on there and did, like, a best hits of, like, going after liberals, going after snowflakes, going after the LGBTQ plus community, going after Roe v. Wade, going after, you know, whatever woke stuff. You could easily do the hits and get people cheering, get people happy and shit. But instead, you go on there and you insult the very people that you're meant to be going on there to kind of, you know, jazz up and get them all hyped and pumped for. And then you have the, you have the audacity to blame National Geographic, to blame all these other things for why you're flopping and not even just owning the L, you know, just owning it and owning it, owning it. No, you don't own it. You blame other people. So I quite like how this is panning out. How I think it's gone on. And the coverage around it has been fucking glorious to see everybody in real time realizing that, oh, Rogan's friends aren't actually funny. They're just famous like Rogan. That's it. I like that everybody's realizing it in real time. Rogan's friends aren't funny. They're just really famous. That's it. Look at this report, courtesy of CBS Miami. Thank you. With eight days until election day, the Trump campaign is facing backlash over crude and racist comments toward Puerto Rico that were made during a rally. CBS News Miami's Yvonne Taylor joins us live from Wynwood with reaction. Yo, big up, uh, big up Abe Martinez in the, in, in the stream chat. Yeah, I'm Puerto Rican. Everybody hates Trump, but that pissed them off last night. And all my family called to tell me <laughs> what he said. Exactly. It's like, bro, why? <laughs> why would you say this? <laughs> it makes no sense. And, and it felt like so, like, I don't know. It just felt, it just didn't make any sense. It, you would probably, it probably would have made more sense if you would have said that about, Whoever the whoever the migrants are coming over now and making all the trouble in New York. I don't know if they're from Venezuela. I don't know if they're from Chile. I don't know Chile. I don't know if they're from Peruvian. I don't know if they're from Honduras. But it would have made more sense to just go that way if you wanted to insult people from that part of the world. Just go that way, right? Think of those people who are coming over the border, who people are blaming for taking all their jobs and their houses. Point there. Why are you pointing at the Puerto Ricans? What the fuck have they done? What are you saying fuck me for? to the offensive comments and whether it could impact the Hispanic vote. Yvonne? And that's the big question, Lauren. Now, I must say that the <laughs> joke about Puerto Rico was not Puerto the only Rico, thing that the love comedians it. The said the at the rally Puerto for Rico. former President Donald Trump. He also had more to say about other Latinos, too. Take a listen. <laughs> Believe it or not, people, I welcome migrants to the United States of America with open arms. And by open arms, I mean like this. <laughs> it's wild. And these Latinos, they love making babies too. Just know that. It's offensive, not only to Puerto Ricans. But <laughs> what kind of jokes are these jokes? 
what kind of jokes are these jokes honestly there's there's never like an there's never a moment of like hey how can i best entertain my audience as anthony jeselnik once said right the famous quote on that fear of one podcast something along the lines of like it's not you're not being a funny comedian when you're just offending people for offending people's sake you're meant to get away with it that's the funny bit the funny bit is making a joke that's dicey dicey but you get away with it so we all laugh not you just laughing on stage at us we're all meant to laugh together oh my god that was way that was fucking crazy that was too soon that was below the belt but he's fucking funny he's making a good point these comedians just sound like they're being like racist isn't it muy 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 racismo but to every Latino. Whether it's arroz con gandules, mofongo, or any other Puerto Rican platter, mofongo. there was an inevitable talk with their meal. At this est- bro, bro, look at that plate, bro. Look at that plate. Po- I'm falling asleep. What the fuck is that? Puerto Rican platter. Is that for lunch? Are you going to bed after that? Or are you going to work? There was an in- look at inevitable that. talk with... Look at that. I'm going to sleep. Oh my God. Look, there's a basket of bread as well. There's a basket of bread, appetizer, little, little, little fucking starter, little finger food. And what the fuck is that? A bowl of rice? There's some meat. Is that a schnitzel? Yo, I'm devouring everything on that plate, but I'm not working again. I'm not working again. I'm not lifting any heavy machinery. I'm not stacking shelves. I'm not delivering anything. I'm going to sleep. I might, I maybe, I might sleep on that chair. I might sleep on that chair. Oh my God. Look at how delicious that looks. How the fuck did these people eat like this and still work and still exist? I'd be in bed. Wow, I look so good. Their meal at this establishment in Wynwood. I don't think this was unexpected. At El Borinquen, Puerto Rican restaurant in Wynwood, nobody Ooh. believed that the jokes by... Com- what the fuck is that with the onions? With the caramelized onions? What is that? Puerto Rican restaurant in Wynwood. Is that like a turkey steak or a chicken steak? What is that? With like the onions diced on to oh, 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 oh give me that baby with the caramelized onions on top. Are you dumb? Honestly, give me a plate, please, and a large glass of Coca-Cola or something. God damn. Nobody believed that the jokes by comedian Tony Hitchlick at Madison Square Garden on Sunday were not planned. No smart campaign manager would have alone allowed this happen without knowing in advance what they were gonna say. I'm very afraid. Susanna Baxter asked me to sit with her because Susanna Baxter is a bit of a dimey, dimey, isn't it? Susanna Baxter is a bit of a dimey, dimey. She told me she would say what her community Abuela would get the abuel. Would not. I'm a woman. Mm. I'm a Puerto Rican woman. Susanna Baxter. I was raised in New York City. Mm. I know what racism is. Mm. Local Republican politicians also reacted. This guy's a comedian, not a very funny one. And I think what he said was insulting. But on the other hand, I don't think, you, you know, everything that's said by people supporting a candidate should be directly uh, attributed to the candidate themselves. Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar wrote on X, formerly known as Twitter. This rhetoric does not reflect GOP values. Puerto Rico sent... Oh, look at the comment. Disgusted by at Tony Hinchcliffe's racist comments calling Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage. This rhetoric does not reflect the GOP values. Puerto Rico has sent 48,000 plus soldiers to Vietnam with over 345 Purple Hearts awarded. The bravery deserves respect. Educate yourself. God damn. 48,000 plus soldiers to Vietnam. She ended up saying, educate yourself. The message Educate yourself. I love the accent. <laughs> And the Trump campaign has said that the jokes made by the comedian had nothing to do with former president Donald Trump. Now, as far Bro, Donald Trump has thrown Tony Hinchcliffe under the bus the same way Brian Callen threw Crystal under the bus when it got revealed that he might be a diddler. Honestly, I don't know him. I don't know who the guy is. Never heard of him. The way Donald Trump threw Tony Hinchcliffe under the bus was absolutely fabuloso. And I have to actually get this up here to show you guys what I mean by this, because this legitimately was one of the best throwing throwings under the buses I've ever seen in my entire life. He completely, unequivocally disavowed and distanced himself from Tony Hinchcliffe, despite him knowing who he is, being pals with Rogan. For sure, Trump knows who the guy was. And if he would have went well, he would have been sucking him off. But the moment he went badly, Tony Donald Trump, like a like a consummate politician. Like a consumer professional decided, you know what? I don't know you. I don't fucking know you. 
Get away from me now, please. Get away from me now, please. Let me see where I can find it because that legitimately was one of the funniest things I've seen in a million in a million years. See how quickly Donald Trump disavowed Tony Hinch. Let's see if I can get it up on here. Bear with me one second. Ba 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 ba. Ba 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 ba. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. There's the clip here, right here. Look at Donald J. Trump unequivocally, you know, go out of his way to make sure he lets everybody else know that he has no idea who Tony Hinchcliffe is. They are not friends. That's not his boy. What that guy said was what he said. I, I didn't say that. I don't know this motherfucker. Keep him well away from me. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. There for the whole thing. I don't know what time you got there. Uh, I was told and made aware that you had no idea about this comedian who made comments. I still have, I have no idea who he is. Somebody <laughs> said there was a comedian that joked about Puerto Rico or something. And I have no idea who he was. Never saw him, never heard of him. And don't want to hear of him. But I have no idea. They put a comedian <laughs> ouch, in. Ouch, ouch. You throw comedians in. Ouch. Don't vet them and go crazy. It's nobody's fault. Ouch. But somebody said some bad things now what they've done is taken <laughs> don't know who he is has never met him the party has nothing to do with us said something and they try and make a big deal but i don't know who it is i don't even know who put him in uh, and i can't imagine it's a big deal i've done more for puerto rico than any president i think that's ever that's ever been president oh honestly i fucking love it i fucking love it what a beautiful sight to see everybody waking up to the fact that to Brent, sorry, Joe Rogan or Brendan Shaw. Joe Rogan and his friends aren't funny. But one thing I find really interesting as well about this whole backlash has been the refusal of these guys to just put on a good show, you know? Like the selfishness, like it's, it's involved in this because surely at a Trump rally, part of the reason why you're there is to kind of rah-rah the crowd, get them excited, get them hyped because they're all there because they're fans of Trump anyway, whoever the political person is. So you're just, you know, political candidate or presidential candidate. You're just there to kind of like, you know, get them pumped, make them have a good time, make them smile, make them jump, make them laugh, whatever, or make them cry with some sort of a motivational moving message. But you're not really there to razz them, to diss them, to like, it's not really that kind of environment. Just go on there and just give them the hits. Start taking the piss out of migrants or start taking the piss out of LGBTQ folk, woke folk censorship in general council culture there's so many easy jokes you could get them laughing at even at themselves that don't have to be so racismo coded but these guys what you realize with a lot of these guys these stand-up comedians especially given all the time or given the amount of years i've spent following stand-up comedy the years i've done the stream random show and been on the reddit all this malarkey you realize by nature comedians are quite selfish they're not really in it for the like you think comedians are like service, like they're kind of, you know, they work in the service industry, as in like the customer is always right, um, as in like they're trying to put on the best show possible for the fans, for the viewers. No, all comedians want to get to a point where they can just do what they want to do on stage. They're not really bothered about if you have a good time, if you laugh, if you enjoy the show. They just want to get to a point in their career where they get no notes, they get no advice, they get no input, they're so famous and so well known where they can just do what they want to do on stage, where people, you know, just let them kind of do what they want. A la fucking, you know, Burt Kreischer, getting on stage, taking off his top, showing you his, you know, his boxer shorts with like, you know, skid marks on it and shit. They want to get to that stage. They're not really fussed about if you had a good time. Oh, did you like it better than last year? What was your favorite show of mine that I did live? Oh, 2017. How did my show in 2024 compare to 2017? But no, they don't care. They just want to. They just want to play at the biggest venues to get the man to you know to sell out the tickets to make the most amount at the gate to brag about on social media to have that fucking you know Jesus pose on the stage take a big picture in front of a sold out crowd. But they care very little about putting on a good show or making their fans laugh. Very little. This is a good example of it. This is such an easy, easy win for a comedian who likes Trump, who's in that kind of, just go on stage and talk to your quote-unquote people. If you're an actual Republican, talk to your people, you know, make a joke about, oh my God, I could be relaxed around here. I don't have to worry about cancer culture. You know, I can say whatever, say some word, you know, and get people laughing without somebody coming on stage and arresting me. You know, da 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 I don't know, make some pronoun joke. You know, talk, do something. Make some joke about the names that they put on the Starbucks cup. Do something funny. 
Like, it's not that difficult. It really flipping isn't. But again, it's all about them. He wanted to go in there and flex that he's the roast guy, kill Tony guy, another audition. And weirdly enough, you know, this would be, it would be so, it would be so funny if all of these guys who have been going out of their way to glaze and to really suck up to someone like Trump would go out of their way. And they've now been embraced, by the way, because Trump, you know, kind of needs them in this regard. I think in the first time he would have never embraced them the way that he did, because I think he was way more popular then when he's running for the first term. But now that he kind of needs their support, because people are saying, you know, the polls maybe down to a wire, but it depends who you re listen to. But I'd imagine, you know, based on what happened last time, they don't want to take any chances. They're taking all the help they can get from podcasters and other YouTube channels and whatever else they can get. Understandable. But wouldn't it be funny? If the one time the Trump administration, Republicans in general, embraced this quote unquote new media po comedy podcasting type of people who've been sucking them off from far from ages, and now this comedian might actually cost them the election. Could you imagine if that actually happens? If the embrace actually ends up biting them in the ass and these motherfuckers actually end up costing these guys the election. That'd be fucking hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. And actually deserving. But in general, like I said, I'm just happy to see that everybody's now collectively waking up to the fact that these guys, Rogan's friends, they're just not funny. They're not funny. They're famous because Rogan's super famous. And when he puts his arm around you, he's a kingmaker. He's very generous with his platform. He elevates you also. But these guys are probably the first, I would say they're probably the first media content personalities whose fame really does outweigh their actual talent ability and abilities because at least with like tiktok influencers and shit you don't really expect much from them right they're just pretty faces or they're like cute girls or like hot dudes you know like they, you don't really expect much from them based but apart from what they look like but with comedians they have this idea in their head that they're all killers and murderers and they're all beasts and shit but it's really not you're not really you're just friends with rogan and rogan likes you so he gasses you up and he talks about you all the time on his pod and makes people then believe that you're really good but when when we actually watch your material when we see you actually do the thing that you say you're a murderer at we're like huh why do you sound so shit why do you sound so average why does your material don't match your instagram followers or your clout or your fame it's really odd and it might be because most of you guys aren't really that funny you aren't really that funny especially outside of their little bubble right they're kind of um, for lack of a better term, <coughs> out of their echo chamber, right? Uh, out of their, you know, out of their safe space. They're not really that funny. Really and really not that funny. Well, once they're put in front of regular schmegular people uh, live, they all crumble. I find that absolutely, absolutely, absolutely hilarious how the majority of comedians who have gone on those big platforms, live shows in front of regular schmegular civilians who they kind of look down on, they think, oh, we've got the best job in the world and they have to go to Q All these people that they think that they're better than. And then you, you're, you're asked to, you know, do a set of like, what, 10 minutes, or, if that, of some of your best material and you still manage to bomb. Youch. Youch, youch, youch. But again, what do I know? Absolutely nothing.